On today's show, Terrence Davis is out for the rest of the season. Trade rumors continue to roll through old Sacramento like tumbleweeds. And special guest James Hamm stops by the Royal Rebound set to discuss De'Aaron Fox. That's all coming up on the Royal Report. Good morning, good morning. Welcome back to Royal Rebounds, a Sacramento Kings YouTube channel for fans, by fans. This is episode 15 of the Royal Report, a Sacramento Kings sports talk show where we wrap up an entire week of Kings action in just about 30 minutes. If you're a Kings fan, make sure you hit that like button down below and consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks again for stopping by Royal Family on another fantastic Friday. It's time. Let's get it started with some league news. The all-star rosters, the complete all-star rosters, were officially unveiled earlier this week for this year's game in Cleveland. It will once again be Team LeBron against Team Durant. The two captains will pick from a loaded field of talent uh, in their all-star draft this upcoming Thursday, February 10th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The Golden State Warriors led the way in total all-star selections with three Steph Curry, Draymond Green, and first-time all-star Andrew Wiggins will be in this year's game. Barry, if you were picking first in this draft, who would you take? Well, I'm definitely not taking Andrew Wiggins, but the thing that stood out to me most about this entire thing is no Kings players at all. We got to do better, guys. Come on. We got to do better. I want to see at least one Kings player in the all-star game next season so vote kings players play better i guess <laughs> i don't know on other exciting news dave yeager is now returning to the bench of the philadelphia 76ers after a few month hiatus to deal with head and neck cancer a very very scary situation we all know about dave's success in sacramento having one of the most successful seasons in franchise history while they've been in Sacramento, uh, accumulating 39 wins just a few seasons ago. It does feel like forever at this point, but I just want to say, hey, Monty, potentially Dave's available at the end of the season. Yes, very, very <clears throat> good to see Dave Yeager return to the sidelines. We're all happy for him, both as Kings fans and as basketball fans. It's a great thing to see. The race for the number one seed out west is going to be setting up for an epic finish here between the top two teams in the league all season long in the Golden State Warriors and the Phoenix Suns. Both teams are the first in the NBA to eclipse the 40-win mark this season. The Suns just lost to Atlanta yesterday, snapping an 11-game win streak. However, during that 11-game win streak, they couldn't gain any ground on the Warriors because Golden State is currently on an eight-game win streak of their own. The Suns sit atop the Western Conference at 41-10, and 10, but the Warriors are right on their heels at 40-13. and 13. It's setting up, like I said, for an epic finish here down the stretch of the regular season. Barry, will we be robbed as basketball fans if these two teams don't meet in the Western Conference Finals this year? Oh, 100%. These are the two teams in the West that I want to see face off and play for a chance to make it to the finals. But I think it's still yet to be told who is going to end up with that elusive top spot. You look at the Warriors, they seem to be getting healthier and healthier. Um, the Phoenix Suns have an aging superstar point guard in Chris Paul who always seems to get, get injured later in the season. So it'd be interesting to see kind of how that all shakes out. But yes, I would love to see these two teams battle for a chance to compete for a championship. In other news, February 9th will be the first ever all-female broadcast crew for a nationally televised NBA game. The, they continue to make strides towards equality by race, gender, all sorts of different things. And uh, I'm very happy to see this, Cal. Oh, yeah, definitely big props to all these women who do a fantastic job all the time, and now they'll get to showcase their talents on the national stage. Well, speaking of non-fantastic things, the Kings had another <laughs> week of basketball action, one in three this week, which is actually an improvement over last week's zero wins. They were able to pick up a win over, stay with me here, 
the Brooklyn <laughs> Nets, which is truly incredible. After seeing losses to the Houston Rockets, the Detroit Pistons, this week they dropped drop games to the Sixers, the Knicks, the Warriors, but somehow they were able to come out, Calvin, and beat the Nets. James Harden had a ton of assists in this game, but he only scored four points. I also want to highlight we got to see Tyrese Halliburton set a career high with 38 points uh, this week, and we also got to see Davion Mitchell set a career high with 26 points, still no deer and Fox. Yeah, like you said, it was great to see the Kings get a win, especially against a team <clears throat> like the Brooklyn Nets, who didn't have Ke Kevin Durant uh, and Kyrie Irving and James Harden both had subpar games, but the Kings played better defense. It was a brief moment of happiness for Kings players and for Kings fans as they proceeded to be down by 26 the following night to the Golden State Warriors. I don't think we really learned a lot from this Kings team this week other than are they tanking? We don't really have an answer for that yet. Like you said, no De'Aaron Fox in the lineup still. To me, the, the only bright spot <clears throat> excuse me, this week for the Kings has been um, Davion Mitchell. He's played very, very well in De'Aaron Fox's absence. In the last four games just from this past week, he's averaging 19 points and 5.5 and assists a game while shooting 49% from the field and 37% from three. He included a career-high 26 points last night at Golden State. Barry, he has been much, much better than we saw early on this season. Are you thinking that he still has a, a spot on this team long-term if they're still planning to build around De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton? Oh, 100%. And, you know, I never thought that he didn't have a spot on this team. Uh, many of you that have been tuning in for a while know that Calvin and I were preaching patience early on in the season. He had a couple rough nights, and people were jumping on him. What, what's going on here? Is this guy belong in the NBA? Did the Kings reach and take him too early? Why did he fall to Sacramento at the number ninth pick? And Calvin and I were sitting here saying, this guy's a rookie. Preach patience. Just wait. He'll have a better opportunity later in the season if De'Aaron Fox is not on the court Fast forward, we're later in the season, De'Aaron Fox is not available, and Davion has been playing great in the starting lineup. Yeah, he really has. <clears throat> Love to see that as Kings fans. Another guy who has been playing much better as of late, especially these past two games, is Mo Harkless. A starter early on in the year, a lot of people thought that his defensive ability, uh, his length, he would be able to solidify the, the power forward position for this team moving forward. Fast forward to where we are today, Luke Walton gets fired, Mo Harkless falls out of the lineup for a brief period of time. He is now back as a starter. Two double-digit scoring games back-to-back -back in the last two games for Sacramento. He only had three double-digit scoring games all year prior to those two games. He also had six steals last night against Golden State. Barry, this is the Mo Harkless that this team needs. The question is, how much of a difference does it really make for them at this point? Yeah, great week of basketball for Mo. And we're going to talk about him a little bit more when we return from the break here. But I think what everyone wants to know, Calvin, is what's going on with these trade rumors. We have the Kings interested in a potential Julius Randle deal, Brandon Ingram, Sabonis. We've heard Miles Turner's name mentioned. Are they looking for small pieces at this point? Or are they going for a big blockbuster? Uh, I don't think either of us really know. We're just trying to get a move done and that's why we're trying to get hashtag Hey Monty trending. But I want to hear your thoughts, Calvin. Well, my thoughts are I'm more confused today than I have been through this whole process. Ben Simmons has been the prize that Sacramento has had their eyes set on all season long. And we've heard every situation, every scenario come out of this except for an actual deal being done. It's rumored that the Kings are officially done with trade talks including the Philadelphia 76ers. They don't want to take on Tobias, uh, Tobias Harris's contract, which is quite a lofty one. I don't know if you can really blame them too much for that. But we've heard rumors about all these guys, like you mentioned, Julius Randle. Uh, now Brandon Ingram is starting to come up more. People like Sabonis, Miles Turner. Um, at the end of the day, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. We don't know what these conversations are are like between Monty McNair and these other NBA GMs. It's disappointing to me to hear the stories come out that the Kings are now off 
the table or off trade discussions with a lot of these players like Randall, like Ben Simmons, like DeMontis Sabonis. It just worries me that there's not going to be enough time for them to get a real meaningful deal done uh, that's going to impact this team greatly moving forward. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, you know, Kings fans, when looking at Monty's tenure in Sacramento, their biggest issue with him is that he's just kind of sat back and hasn't made a move. But, you know, that's not true. He has made some moves. They've been small moves, yes. He brought in Terrence Davis, which I thought was a great move at the end of last season. He was able to bring in Tristan Thompson this year for a guy like DeLon Wright, who he's able to acquire last year at the trade deadline. And then you look at the failed trades. The Buddy Heald to the Lakers for Montrez Harrell, KCP. That looked like it could have been a pretty good deal for Sacramento. Oh, and also including Kyle Kuzma. You also look at the failed Bogdanovich trade to the Bucks for Dante DiVincenzo. I don't think Monty lost any of these deals. Although they were falling apart the last second and didn't end up going through, I do have to applaud him in the fact that he has not made a bad deal so far, which unfortunately us Kings fans have become way too accustomed to at this point. We're going to take a quick break here, and when we come back, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into Mo Harkless and decide whether Mo needs Mo minutes or not. Well, Calvin, we've been very, very mean to Mo Harkless early on in this season, saying, get this guy out of the starting lineup. He can't score. All we need are 10 points from him, and the Kings would win a ton of these games. Now he's back in the starting lineup due to an injury to Marvin Bagley, and he's playing pretty well, Calvin. His last two games, he's had double-digit scoring outputs, 18 in the last game, 10 in the game before that, and most importantly in this last game, six steals that you mentioned earlier. We've seen Mo Harkless yelling at players on the bench, most specifically Buddy Heald. And we've said, hey, where's the leadership on this team? What's going on? How are you going to let teams blow you out? How are you going to get down by this much and not have any vocal leader? I think Mo has possibly emerged as that guy, Calvin. What do you think about Mo? Is, is he a, a leader for this Kings team? Where does he rank for you? Yeah, I think he is a leader for this team. He hasn't been with the team as long as some of these other guys that you would like to assume those leadership positions like De'Aaron Fox or Buddy Heald or Harrison Barnes. But those guys also, it doesn't seem necessarily to be quite in their personality to be the, the type of player that's in your face all the time or that barks out demands throughout the course of a game. There are other ways to be a leader, but that's kind of in the sports world what we come accustomed to seeing out of leaders a lot of times. And Mo Harkless definitely does that. The problem for Mo and for a lot of other players on this team, almost every player on this team, has just been consistency. It's great to be a vocal leader, but you also have to produce when you're out on the court. And Mo Harkless has both not produced at times this season. He's also not been on the court at all at times this season. So I give him props for sure of staying ready when his name is called. A lot of players have had that sort of mentality on the team this season as the lineups and the rotations have been completely swirling and changing all season long. It's been really hard for some of these other role players to gain a lot of traction on this team because they just don't know when their minutes are going to come from. Um, so Mo has definitely played a lot better this week. He's a guy that it, when he plays like this, the Kings definitely could use his help on this team. However, again, it's just been a lack of consistency from him and from a lot of other guys on this roster, including the, the bigger name players on this team. De'Aaron Fox has been inconsistent this season. Tyrese Halliburton has been inconsistent in terms of how aggressive he is scoring this season. Davion's been all over the map. So this team has uh, that problem from top to bottom on the roster. They are a much better team, though, when a guy like Mo Harkless, who's one of the better defenders on this team, plays with a lot of energy and is able to knock down a couple threes as well. Yeah, Mo Harkless was a big reason why the Kings were able to beat the Nets this past week. But as you mentioned, inconsistency has been the name of the game for your Sacramento Kings it starts at the top. It starts with coaching. Coach was fired early on in the season. Then it goes down to rotations and minutes. 
without consistency for these players, how can they be consistent? That's my main question. And a lot of them, most of them, probably are sitting around their house right now wondering if they're going to be on the team at the end of next week, which does also make it a lot difficult to show up and give your best effort night in and night out. Speaking of guys who give a great effort night in and night out, we won't see any of that effort from Terrence Davis for the rest of the season. After that pretty big fall he took against the Boston Celtics, he ended up damaging a tendon in his right wrist, eventually had season-ending surgery earlier this week to repair that tendon. He'll be reevaluated in three months. Barry Terrence Davis, another guy that we talk about being up and down in terms of consistency playing, averaging 10 points, three rebounds, and one assist so far this season. We saw him play much, much better just a couple weeks ago, his best basketball of the season while De'Aaron Fox started to be sidelined, including a career-high 28 points, uh, or th excuse me, 32 points, I, feel, I think it was. Does this guy have a spot on the team moving forward? Are you even thinking about keeping him as one of the players, or is he completely expendable like uh, a bunch of other players on this roster? Well, I really like Terrence Davis. It's unfortunate, you know, injuries are always unfortunate, but I love what I've seen from him. He is one of the guys that has definitely not quit on this team. Unfortunately, he had that fall. We were all worried about a potential head injury but it ended up being a wrist injury. When you have those big falls, you usually put your hands down in front of you to help brace it. So it's unfortunate, but at least he didn't have a major head injury. He was playing, I think, the best basketball of his entire career. His two games prior to the injury, he averaged over 28 points per game. And uh, he's really been doing everything for the Sacramento Kings. And Honestly, I would much rather have him on the squad than a guy like Buddy Heald. Buddy Heald is going to be the first guy out for me, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the thing that's really important to me about this whole Terrence Davis thing is, yes, he's still young. Yes, he's getting better. I want to see more from him. But I think this injury has been really key for Davion Mitchell. Now we're seeing Davion start. He's getting more minutes. He just set a career high last night, and he is playing – the best basketball of his career. So it's a horrible thing to lose a guy to injury, but it opens up opportunities for other guys on the roster, and Davion has definitely capitalized on that. Yeah, he absolutely has. Like you said, though, the problem is for the team as a whole. This team just isn't very good, even when they're at full strength. So to lose all of these players to injury or to COVID-related symptoms and protocols – it just puts so much more of a strain on this team. It also puts a strain on the front office. You talked about Terrence Davis being an ideal replacement in the role that Buddy Heald is playing on this team. If Buddy Heald is going to be the first guy traded from the Sacramento Kings and you don't now have Terrence Davis to come in off the bench, that might change what you have to look for in a returning deal for a guy like Buddy Heald. It just creates more problems for this Kings team that already has enough piling on top of them. It's definitely helping out our draft pick though. So there's always <laughs> that, a silver lining, true. right? That always a silver lining. All right, Calvin, let's talk about the trade deadline. So the trade deadline is coming up here very, very fast. February 10th. We are less than a week away at this point. And there are guys on this roster, Calvin, who have wanted to be out for a while. Now it's becoming more and more evident. I'm talking about guys like Buddy Heald, talking about guys like Marvin Bagley. Both have been vocal about wanting a change of scenery. Marvin Bagley is now out with an injury. Buddy Heald has been playing horribly lately. But then there's a couple other guys on the roster. You know, I'm looking at guys like Tristan Thompson, who has been a real bright spot for the Sacramento Kings early on in the season. Now he's kind of relegated to this bench cheerleader role. We haven't seen him play in a while. And then the elephant in the room, De'Aaron Fox, is sitting out with an ankle injury. He's had MRIs. They said that there's no damage to the ankle. It's, it's basically a pain tolerance at this point. Fox admitted that himself, and he said that basically he couldn't deal with the pain and get on the court. So, Calvin, as you look across this roster, are there guys that have quit on the team? Are there guys that want to get out of here? 
I want you to name some names and I want <laughs> you to tell me what, what you're dealing with these guys. Well, you're, you're dealing with a bunch of very egocentric because that's what professional athletes are. That's not a knock against anybody. You, you gotta be confident in yourself. Um, to, to a vain degree a little bit. So when you have really, really confident alpha male type people who have been the best players on their teams their entire lives come together to try to win as a group and they fail to do that on multiple occasions for a few of these core groups of players on this team like De'Aaron Fox, Buddy Heald, Harrison Barnes, they've been together for a number of years now and it really hasn't gone very well overall. Of course, we're all, they're all human beings. Uh, the pressure of losing, the pressure of hearing about the playoff drought, all of that stuff, trade talks, that's going to get to you at some point. I I'm not going to be somebody that literally calls out someone as a quitter on this team because I don't think that I'm qualified to do that. That being said, I'd be very surprised to hear that there aren't any players on this team that want out of this situation. I feel like, again, that's a human tendency at a certain point. For people like Tristan Thompson, uh, who is already talking about retirement next season, very early on this year, this year is definitely lost if he stays in Sacramento. He doesn't even touch the court anymore. Maybe he doesn't want to go ride out the rest of the season on another squad. Maybe he's content with just sitting on the bench. But I feel like you have to kind of check out a little bit if you're in that situation. And for Buddy Heald... How could you blame him for being checked out? He thought he was going to be a Los Angeles Laker on draft night. He's been the biggest topic of trade conversations for the Sacramento Kings for probably the last two seasons now. Always named, mentioned about being traded to another team. Uh, he has been piled on by everybody, fans and people that cover this team as of late due to his inconsistent play. So I wouldn't be surprised at all for him to want out of Sacramento as well. De'Aaron Fox is the wild card to me. I really hope that he hasn't quit on this team because that would be catastrophic. He's the best player, franchise player. They gave him the max extension. They told him they want to build around him. If he is mentally disconnected from this team now, it's going to be incredibly hard to repair that relationship, even if you're able to pull off a major deal for somebody like Ben Simmons. So the Kings absolutely have to be worried about that, and I would be talking to him every single day if I was in the front office of this team trying to gauge his temperature and trying to help repair the relationship in the best way that I could. Yeah, you know, it's we all talk about how defense is contagious, how effort is contagious. I think it goes the other way as well. When you have guys like Buddy Heald that were traded during the offseason – According to James, this trade was as far as it could have gone. Like, Buddy Heald already chose out his jersey number on the Lakers before the trade fell apart. So when you bring back guys like that, and they're sitting in the locker room, and you're Deer and Fox, and you're looking around, and you're saying, I'm the leader of this team, I'm the franchise player, the team has to help me as well. The front office needs to surround me by guys that can help me be a better player and can just make shots and help me out overall. When you look around and you see guys on this roster that are still here, that are still going out on the court with you, that don't want to be here, that's contagious. It's just a matter of how far that's really gotten, and the Kings need to do something to stop the bleeding. We're going to take another quick break here, and when we get back, we're going to jump into Calvin's favorite part of the show, Cowboy Questions. Welcome back the Royal Report and our favorite segment of the show called Cowbell Questions. You have questions. We have answers. Let's get our first from producer Vinny. Why is Alvin not playing more guys? This is the question that I've been asking myself for a while now because I, I think that this is basically a lost season at this point. But Alvin has been adamant in some of his post-game press conferences where he, he hasn't named any specific players, but he, he said that some players have, you know, given up or are not trying as hard. And his job is to get the guys that want to win, the guys that want to play, the guys that are giving effort on the court. Now, I don't know if this has anything to do with benching or only playing, you know, four, maybe five guys off the bench max, but it is a big deal. 
And honestly, it's time to just open up the roster, let these young guys play, let's see what we have, and let's move on to next season. Yeah, I think this might be an issue of the coaching staff maybe seeing things a little bit differently than the front office or vice versa. Uh, It's hard to be in a situation that Alvin Gentry is in obviously he comes in as the interim head coach for a team that is, was currently struggling, has been struggling for a long, long time. The expectations were a little bit higher this year and they have continued to fail in those and fail to meet those expectations. So as an interim head coach, you're always fighting for your life, your coaching life to play all these young guys is essentially punting on this season, which I think we all know that that's the case. <clears throat> but as a coach, it's hard to admit that. You have to still try to go out there and fight every night for a victory. And you do that by playing the players that you think give you the best chance to win. All that being said, it is time to start giving these young guys a little bit more of an opportunity, especially now that you have a lot of the other players that were in the rotation earlier this season who have completely fallen out, like Tristan Thompson and Alex Len. Uh, That should open up the door for Damian Jones, Namias Keita to get a lot more minutes. I don't know about Jamias Ramsey or Robert Woodard, um, but you certainly have a lot of guys here on this team. Lewis King is another player that a lot of people, um, fans especially, have wanted to see play. It's a position that the Kings are thin at in terms of wing depth. So I think you have to kind of evaluate what you have here moving into the trade deadline, knowing that the roster is going to have a lot of change anyway. Don't you want to see a little bit more out of these young guys so you can kind of plan to see if they're going to be in your future plans long term? Yeah, I feel like Alvin Gentry is the guy that goes for it at fourth and 22 and Madden in like the second (laughs) quarter with plenty of time left. So let's get it together, guys. Next question. Who would you rather see back next season, Metu or Jones? This is a tough one. I, I like both of them for, for a lot of reasons, uh, but I'm probably going to lean towards Damian Jones at this point. I think the Kings need to find a better long-term option at power forward anyway. Uh, the question will be, what do they do with Marvin Bagley? Does he get traded? Do they somehow offer him an offer sheet at this offseason, hoping that they can kind of retain him for next season? But I think Damian Jones has a ton of potential, as well as Metu. I think Damian Jones has shown a little bit more uh, already in the short amount of time that he's been given. And Shemezi Metu is kind of more of a, a fringe player. He, he's very inconsistent as an outside shooter, uh, but he doesn't really have a ton of inside moves either. Damian Jones is a little bit more established already in what he does as a basketball player. And he's kind of like a miniature Rashawn Holmes, not miniature in terms of size, but uh, miniature in terms of his opportunity and career playing time so far. Does a lot of the same things that Rashawn Holmes does. Rashawn has struggled a lot this year as well, so I think the Kings need to take a look at what the long-term answer is at center too. Yeah, I agree. I I like Damian Jones a lot, and I feel like he has a, a decent ceiling, but I think he needs more time to develop. Um, he's had some inconsistencies as well. For me, it really depends on where the Kings are going from here. If miraculously they're able to make a big trade before the deadline, they're able to sign some guys in free agency in the offseason, and they're right back and ready to compete next year, I'd probably rather have a guy like Metu on the roster. However, if the Kings punt on this season, they get a high draft pick, they are just building up talent, adding young guys to this roster, and letting them all kind of fight it out and see if, you know, the cream floats to the top, I'm probably going to bring back Damian Jones because I think that he could be potentially a long-term option for Sacramento, but he does need to improve quite a bit before he reaches that. Next Next question. question. What's the first thing you do when you arrive at Golden One Center? Well, the first thing I do is I walk in the building, and then I do an entire lap around. I don't get to go to Golden One as often as I would like to. So every time I go there, there's something new. There's something exciting. I try and go upstairs to the top level, get a proud ale, 
Um, I just love to be in the arena. So if you see me there, I'm probably just going to be walking around the entire time, having a good time, obviously before the game starts, because once the game starts, I'm in my seat, I'm engaged, I'm ready to watch. But it's such a cool building that uh, I'm just a roamer. I'll be there roaming before, after the games, just having a good time. Well, I think what you said there towards the end is very key in that how early am I getting into the arena? If I get there right as the game's starting, I'm probably just going to head straight to my seat because I don't want to miss any of the game. But if I have a little bit of time to spare, our podcast starts every night with we're here drinking beer. So I'm in line to get a beer right away when I get into the stadium. That's first and foremost because those lines are ridiculously long. (laughs) They are. They're too long. They're too long. That's all the time we have for Cowboy Questions. Thank you for your submissions. As always, if you'd like to hear Barry and I answer a question on a future show, just write it in the comment section below this video. Hashtag it, Cowbell Questions. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you guys so much for your questions. So I don't know if you tuned in last night to our podcast live after the loss to the Warriors, but we had special guest James Ham join us. And we caught up with him a little bit. Um, We were very interested in deer and fox and what's going on with that ankle. We asked him to kind of elaborate on deer and fox's ankle injury. And uh, go ahead and take a look here. This is what his response was. Yeah, it's probably the strangest thing that I've ever seen in my time covering the, the Sacramento Kings. And that's 12 seasons. So that's saying a lot when it comes to an injury. Uh, Fox says that he tweaked it against the Detroit Pistons. I think I remember seeing him have like a bad step. Uh, so that's not a big surprise. He said that when he got to the the Milwaukee Bucks game, that he he just didn't feel it. Like they, he started having some pain in the ankle. Uh, it's a low, it's not a high ankle sprain. It's a low ankle sprain. But at this point, I think, what are we at? Seven games. And it's not just seven games. He hasn't played since the 19th. So we're looking at like two plus weeks. And to me, that's really a long time for something that he's been cleared medically without any question. They've gone in and and done MRIs and there's no structural damage. Uh, There's no grade one, grade two, grade three sprain. Um, There is no, you know, hairline fracture of something. Um, So it really does come down to his ability to play through pain, which is something that he talked about, uh, which not a lot of players will uh, will go on record and say, look, it's about pain management and and I can't get through it. Um, So I think when you look at the way that he plays, it is a lot of lateral quickness. He's not what you would call like a true, like straight line driver. Uh, He can still like, he still has his burst. He still has his ability to leap. What he doesn't have is ability to go right and left. And for him, that's pretty substantial. Uh, But at the same time, like your team is losing a lot of games and I think they're one in six without him during this stretch. And I think they're one in four when he went, went out with COVID. Uh, that's not good. And, and this team is sinking deeper and deeper into a hole. So what are they, 16 games under 500 again after the, the loss to the Warriors? And they really need him on the court. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that we're going to see him before the trade deadline. We, we just have no idea. Because every day he comes in, he's questionable. And I'll say this, even like the first time he went, he didn't play against Milwaukee. He wasn't on the injury report. And that's usually like, if you're not on the injury report and then all of a sudden right before game time, we get a a message that, Hey, he's not playing. That's, that's strange. So um, I I don't think he and the team are fully on the same page. uh, But at the same time, you know, it's a player's right to say that his body hurts and that Mm -hmm. something's wrong and that he can't go. Uh, And, and I don't know that it's our place to question it. Um, especially, you know, a guy who typically is a very quick killer. You talked about the grade three. He was out seven weeks with the grade three back in November of 2019. And uh, he came back so much quicker than anyone would have ever expected. Like it was almost like miraculous how quickly he came back. We want to thank James very, very much for taking time out of his busy schedule to stop by the Royal Rebounds podcast We appreciate it very much. We're going to add his social media handles as well as the link to his own YouTube channel in the description of this video. Make sure you go check it out. James Hamm has been covering the team for a long time and has a wealth of information. 
really, really great guy. And we, again, appreciate it very much. We're also posting the video of the entire interview later this afternoon. So make sure you guys check that out as well. Moving on to the next week of Kings basketball here as we wrap up the show. Kings have three games this coming week. Starts tomorrow on the road against the Oklahoma City Thunder, who they lost a heartbreaking game to earlier this season, followed by the last home back-to-back of the season, February 8th and 9th at Golden One Center against the suddenly surging Minnesota Timberwolves. Barry, there is no week of basketball that is an easy week for the Sacramento Kings. We are particularly excited about this week still, though, aren't we? We are excited. It's a a little bit easier schedule than the Kings have been uh, through over the last two weeks, and there are some games at home. They do face the Oklahoma City Thunder, who are currently sitting below the Sacramento Kings, but they are on a two-game winning streak at this point. And then you talk about Minnesota and the Timberwolves. Calvin and I will be at both of these games live at Golden One Center. Make sure you guys check us out. And we will be doing live post games just across the way at Punch Bowl Social directly after the game. So make sure you join us for both of those. Unfortunately, as you mentioned, the Timberwolves are playing better as of late. They're 27 and 25 on the season. They are currently on a three game winning streak. It's not looking good for your Kings, Calvin. No, no, it's not looking good. But we'll still be there sitting courtside on the ninth to take in the game against the Timberwolves. If you're around uh, downtown Sacramento that those two days or at the game, stop by. We would love to see you, love to say hi, have a beer with you, and all that fun stuff. And hopefully we get a Kings win or two out of it as well. Yeah, you guys can hit us up on Instagram at Royal Rebounds to find out where we are during that entire week. And uh, yeah, we'll be just out having fun, meeting people, and uh, trying to soak in as much Golden One and Kings action as we can. We want to thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Royal Report. Make sure you guys hit that like button down below and consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoy awesome Kings content like this. We will see you all on Saturday for a live post game after the Kings Thunder game. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful Friday. And in the meantime, go Kings.